a little bit about schools and learning, what we bundle together to call education. Now, a lot of the players involved say they need some change, reform. But I happen to agree with Ken Robinson that we really need an educational revolution. Why a revolution? Well, our world has completely changed. My husband and I are both techies, and at home we like to peek each other out. And one of the games we play probably should be called I'm So Smart. And we can play this game because we constantly have technology at our fingertips. We'll be watching TV and something will come up like, Hey hon, do we use pink lemons to make pink lemonade? And within seconds, we know the answer. But ten years ago, that conversation would have been a lot different. Pink lemons? I don't know, I never saw a pink lemon before, have you? It's probably just food coloring. And we would have been satisfied letting that unanswered question just flew away. In today's changed world, we are constantly fact-checking our lives. And why not? I don't need to be so smart anymore and keep it all up in my head. I can get any information at any time. Think of how powerful that is. Our students can access any information from anywhere. Yet our educational system hasn't changed very much. So, I know learning in schools are very important topics, so please don't think I'm being flippant when I ask, what if education was a little bit more like Google? Now, a disclaimer before I start. I was accepted to the Google Teacher Academy in New York City in 2008. It's a day-long academy that allows teachers to collaborate and learn how to use Google tools in their classrooms and everyday lives. And if you know me, you know how I feel about Google, <laughs> but trust me, I'm not trying to push their products or their company. I just feel like there's something special about some of the ideals that Google encapsulates. And if we could weave some of those ideals into the fabric of, it, of education, I think we'd be well on our way to a process and a system that was really about learning and growth. And that's what education is all about, right? So, Google was invented to search for information. The name Google comes from a math term that a one represents, represents a one followed by 100 zeros. And Larry's survey chose it to represent the ever-growing number of websites that users need to navigate through. Now I can talk for 18 full minutes on how I think our students should be using meaningful and effective search to build their own learning. But right now I'm just going to talk about logistics of search. In schools, we collect data on our students, both formally and informally. We don't do it because we're big brother and we're nosy. It's because we want to know our students, and good teachers know about their students. So here's a little bit about Carl. He's a fourth grade student. We know he had an individual education plan for a learning disability. We know his standardized test scores, his math grades. We know that he has a peanut allergy and that every year his mom asks that he not be placed in a class with Johnny because they're very competitive. So in September, his fifth grade teacher needs to talk to the guidance counselor, school nurse, fourth grade teacher, special education teacher, and stop the student file to find out that information. It's a lot of stops for one student. If this information was searchable, she could find what she needed when she wanted it and spend the rest of her time with the students, which is what we want to do, right? Time is a big commodity in schools these days. Yet student information isn't the only data that should be searchable. Human resources information. List of supplies. The prices of supplies. Lesson plans. Anything that teachers and parents are looking for almost on a daily basis. For this information to be useful, though, it needs to be accurate and easy to find. Another Google idea that they have is their 80-20 rule. Google employees are encouraged to follow their own twist on the Pareto principle, which is in any endeavor, roughly 80% of the effects is up to 20% of the causes. What a great way to promote ingenuity. Spend 20% of your time working on a project that you think is important. You know, solicit your fellow employees, start a committee, run with it, just do it. Uh, Gmail actually was an idea from the 80 20 rule. So, how do we apply this to education? Let's start with the teachers. Give teachers 20% of their time to work on any endeavor that they think is important. Self directed professional development, teacher created and directed curriculum committees. Just give us time. Many of us are chock full of ideas just waiting for an opportunity to put them into action. And our students, what if we gave them 20% of their time to work on any project they wanted? Would some of them work on a free ice cream for all initiative? Well, maybe, but there are life lessons to be learned in running with a crazy idea. But if they knew they had support and freedom, 
I'm role models and teachers and older students who are doing the same thing. What could they do? What could they do? Maybe you're worried they could just play. <laughs> this is a picture of me and my sister April, who happens to be a member of the AFS team here. And uh, I think she's looking for her teeth. So, anyway, <laughs> Google. We all know Google has fun perks for their staff members, including game rooms. They work hard, they need a break, we all have steam. But can play actually enhance learning? Lev Vygotsky said yes. He was a psychologist who studied cognitive development. And he said through play, we have an opportunity to recreate and experiment with our relationship to people and objects. Experiment. There's not a lot of time left in the school day anymore. It's so chock full of <coughs> skills and content. There's not a lot of time for experimentation. This is a video I'm going to show just a little clip of it in a second um, that I found on a blog post by Dean Cheresky. And he entitled his blog post, What Does Joy Have to Do With Learning? And uh, it's students that are from Wartburg College in Iowa, and they're having a late night study session, and they needed a break. They're in what looks to be the small study lounge on campus. So I'm just going to show you a little clip, but if you have time, please watch this whole thing. Yeah, I'm worried that it's going to quit recording. I feel like I need a little I'm sorry, you know what I I'm just waiting for some Miley. Ten, ten seconds, ten seconds. Five seconds. Five, four,
top of our priority list. We're not taking full advantage of connectivity. Many districts lag behind when it comes to hardware, software, IT support, bandwidth. And the worst part? A lot of American students still think the teacher knows most of the answers. It's a lot of pressure. Good teachers are still saying, Bobby, well, that's a great question. Let's go down to the library and look that up in a book that was published in 1998. Come on, when was the last time you used a book to find factual information because it was the best resource available to you? When the power was out and your mobile device wasn't charged? In school, we look for authentic learning experiences. Yet the way learning is taking place in school most of the time is not keeping up with the way learning takes place in the real world. Google tools tickle my techie bone. I can email, create documents, calendars, you name it, and share it with whomever I choose because it's web-based. And it's free. Now, free is a golden word in education these days. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to the budget crises that are affecting, affecting our districts across the nation. But this is Ted. This is an idea I think is worth sharing, so bear with me. We'd all love to work for an employer like Google who gets free lunches to their employees every day. And yes, I would love it if the lunches my students and I ate looked more like this. Yum. <laughs> and less like this. <laughs> Truly, one of our lunches. But, you know, let's think bigger. We can do more than that. Evenings, weekends, and summer months, our schools are practically empty. Sure, there's an occasional basketball team or brownie troop, but we're not taking full advantage of the resource. If we had unlimited money, unlimited funding, why not use the buildings all year long? Families are already familiar with the staff in the building, so take advantage of it. Hold family health clinics, uh, outreach programs, social events, you name it, all year long. This is, um, community and schools really should hold hands more often. They really do make great partners. As we all know, our, with recent technology advances, our level of connectivity has gone through the roof. Devices are now mobile, fast, and versatile. Shigata Mitra did experiments where he put computers in the hands of students all over the world, especially those living in poverty. And he just gave them computers and said, go to it. And within hours, these children taught themselves how to use computers. And these are children with little to no formal education. Yet here in the United States, where we claim to have uh, education at the top of our priority list, we're not taking full advantage of connectivity. Many districts lag behind when it comes to hardware, software, IT support, bandwidth. And the worst part, a lot of American students still think the teacher knows most of the answers. It's a lot of pressure. Good teachers are still saying, Bobby, well, that's a great question. Let's go down to the library and look that up in a book that was published in 1998. Come on, when was the last time you used a book to find factual information because it was the best resource available to you? When the power was out and your mobile device wasn't charged? In school, we look for authentic learning experiences. Yet the way learning is taking place in school most of the time is not keeping up with the way learning takes place in the real world. I spoke with a friend of mine who was hired by Google recently as a software engineer, and he shared a little bit of his interview process with me. And he said that during his few days of interviewing, he was able to demonstrate his skills as a software engineer. <coughs> but what was unique is that he was hired to be a part of the team, not for a specific position. So the expectation was that he would grow and change as time went on, and so would his responsibilities at Google. But during his interview, he was also able to show them that he was a problem solver confident in his skills, flexible, a go-getter, an innovator. They can trust him to take an idea and run with it. Yet teachers are often hired for a specific position, kindergarten and eighth grade science. And although they may be a member of a grade level team, once the day starts, the door closes and you're an island. What's interesting is that administrators often look for the qualities in teachers that are similar to the qualities Google looks for in their software engineers. Yet teachers are rarely given the opportunity to be innovators. They're often handed a teacher's manual that's modeled on state standards and said, teach this. Now, yes, there are bad teachers, just like there are bad financial advisors, garbage collectors, and architects. But so many teachers are driven, highly educated, highly motivated people 
who are looking for a chance to do more and to do it better. So I say, let's make sure they have the funding, the time, and administrators that support them as the professionals that they are. Hopefully everyone here has used Google Maps before. They're awesome. Uh, we used them this morning to find the school. And if you haven't had a chance, this is how it works. They, Google Maps gives you an opportunity to see locations in a variety of views. This view, a view like this, and with Street View, a close-up like this. And what's great about Street View is that it takes an abstract location on a map and it turns it into something familiar and recognizable. This happens to be my school. So, the way I see things these days in education is that our state and federal leaders often see education from this view. Our community leaders and community members on a local level will see education from this view. But it's our parents, teachers, administrators, and students who get to see education hit on. Currently, local school districts are making decisions that are lassoed by mandates and funding, or lack of funding, on a state and federal level. So if I get this right, the people who see education from this view are telling the people who can see education for what it really is what to do. Now, I don't know what would work, but this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I have a request to make. If you're in a leadership position and you have the confidence of your constituents to make change in education, please visit our schools. Visit many of them and visit often. Talk to the students, the teachers, administrators, everyone, and then make change. This is just too important. <laughs> Lastly, Google's unofficial corporate slogan is don't be evil. Um, if we're going to make a, an educational revolution in this country, we really, everyone needs to be involved, not just parents and politicians, but everyone. So that's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Can you get dicey? Please, don't be evil. This is just too important. Before I go, I'd like to thank the people that are in my head. Don't be frightened. I mean the people that I follow online. These are thinkers and educators that share their knowledge with me and don't even know me. Um, but the seeds of their knowledge have kind of blossomed into this talk. So I just need to thank them and to thank all of you. Thank you.